All right, so we're starting today. First, hello, everybody. Can you hear me first? All right, great, great, great. I hope you are all doing good today. First, I want to start with an announcement concerning the quizzes, the remaining quizzes. All the quizzes have been postponed uh, to April 27. So starting from chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, all of them have been postponed to April 27. All right, so don't wait until the last day to complete those chapter quizzes. Please make sure to, to answer them as we, uh, as we complete each of the chapters. Don't wait until the very last day of the semester to get them completed because after that day, you won't be able to complete any of them. So please make sure that you complete those chapter quizzes as we complete each of those chapters. All right, so we're working now on chapter 10, which is gonna be the lab portion of the muscles. We did start our discussion of the muscles last, last class. We're gonna complete our discussion of the muscles section of chapter 10 today. So you should be able to complete chapter 10 quiz after class today. Chapter nine is gonna be covered next class in our virtual meeting next class. So you should be able to complete chapter nine by the end of this week. But again, all of them are gonna have a due date, the same due date, which is gonna be the Monday before the class ends. So Monday, April 27. If for any reason you did miss lecture exam or any of the quizzes, I would be adding two extra quizzes and one lecture, one extra lecture exam that you can complete to substitute either a missed exam or a missed quiz or a quiz that you didn't do well on. For the labs, they are still on hold. They are still on hold. Until we meet on, on Thursday, I will tell you exactly what we're gonna do for those two remaining lab exams, along with the optional final exams. They are still gonna be on hold until I put together the uh, proctoring uh, examination, all right? So for me to master first how they will be conducted for me to be able to explain the details for you. So again, again, still have three more uh, exams that will be proctored. Those are the muscles lab exam, the nervous system and special senses lab exam, and the final exam, right? For those three exams, they will be conducted through a proctoring platform. I don't have the details yet for me to give them to you. I'm still negotiating with multiple companies for me to get, uh, to get the lowest uh, price for the proctor exam. Yes, the final exam is still optional. The final exam is still optional. It's gonna be substituting the lowest lab exam grade. Right, so again, again, for the quizzes, all of them have been postponed to April 27. All of them have been postponed. All the remaining quizzes have been postponed to April 27. Again, don't wait until April 27 to get them complete. Please get them completed as soon as we complete the chapter in our virtual meeting. Either you're attending them live or you're gonna be watching them later. For the lecture exams, as I've mentioned in the announcement, no changes in those dates. They will be available in the dates period. Let me review with you when the lecture exam is gonna be available. So if you go to announcements, please scroll down 
to the important announcement on here where it say the time for the lecture exam. So where this will be the time frame for the lecture exams. So on April 9th to April 13 for lecture exam three and for lecture exam four is gonna be from April 24th to April 28th. This is gonna be for the lecture exams. I will also put here for you to not get confused. I will create a model, a module on Canvas that, that contains the lecture exams and the, another one that contains the lab exams for you to not uh, look through all those files. All right, so I will be creating like this one that I've created for the quizzes. I will be creating another one for the lecture exams and another one for the lab exams where you can find the direct links for those exams. Again, lab exams are still on hold until I tell you by the end of, of this week or by next week. Maximum, I will tell you exactly how you can complete the lab exams and what's going to be the time frame for each one of the uh, each one of them. Any questions concerning quizzes, lecture exams, or lab exams so far? Any questions concerning lab exams, lecture exams? All right, so if you've got a question that you want to ask about, just send me an email. And if I didn't reply immediately to your email, most likely this is gonna be a common questions that I will be addressing in our next meeting. All right, so let's review quickly what we've been discussing last class. If you remember, multiple ways by which we did name the, the muscles. First, according to the direction of the muscle fibers, if you remember, if I have muscles which are traveling straight, we call those are the recti, rectus muscle. If they are traveling in a right angle, those are the transverse muscles. If they are traveling in at an angle or an oblique angle, we call those are oblique muscles. According to the shape of the muscles also, we might be using this characteristic to name a muscle like a triangular shape, the muscles that we've seen last time. This was a deltoid muscle. Delta again means triangle and oid means it looks like. So a muscle that looks like a triangle is gonna be a, my deltoid muscle. The number of origins also gonna be identifying in some cases the name of the muscle. Name of the muscle can be identified. It can be, I can use the number of origins of the muscle to name the muscle. This is gonna be like the biceps and the triceps muscles. We also did discuss the relative size of the muscle. If I have a large muscle, this is what we're gonna call a maximus or a major muscle compared to a smaller muscle is gonna be a minimus or a minor muscle. So relative size here plays a role in naming the different muscles. Also location of the muscle and its action like a muscle that would be attached to the temporal bone. So we're gonna call this muscle my pectoralis. A muscle located in the gluteal regions is gonna be my gluteus muscle. So location of the muscle did also act as a characteristic according to which we're gonna be naming the muscle. We first started our discussion with the muscles of the head. If you remember, we started by a muscle that is located above the cranium. So we call this muscle is my epicranius. And if you remember, the epicranius has two bellies, an anterior muscle. This is called my frontalis. 
and a posterior muscle. This is what we call the occipitalis muscle. Remember, those two muscles are connected by a sheath-like tendon. We call this as my gala aponeurotica. All this that will be connecting the frontalis muscle to the occipitalis muscle is my gala aponeurotica. If you remember, we did mention the action here of the frontalis muscle. If I have my origin coming from the gala aponeurotica up in here, and I will be contracting the muscle. So again, a muscle contraction is shortening in the length of the muscle. So I'm getting the two points closer to one another. So here, if I am inserted in the skin of the forehead, what's gonna happen? The skin of the forehead is gonna be wrinkled and I will be elevating my eyebrows. So again, contraction of the frontalis muscle of the epicranius is going to be wrinkling the skin of the forehead as well as elevates your eyebrows. Another muscle that we've seen last time was a circular muscle that surrounds the eye. If you remember, a circular muscle that looks like an orbit, we call this as an orbicularis muscle, and I'm related to the eye, so we called it orbicularis oculi. Oculus, oculus means related to the eye. Remember, when you contract the circular muscle, you're going to be closing the eye. It's a constrictor muscle, so when it contracts, it's going to be reducing the diameter of the opening on here in the muscle. And as a result, you're going to be able to blink, you're going to be able to close your eye as a result of this contraction. Another muscle that we've seen last time was a circular muscle, but this time was surrounding the oral orifice, the opening of the mouth. So circular muscle is orbicularis, and something related to the mouth is gonna be oral or oris. So we call this muscle is my orbicularis oris. Orbicularis oris is gonna be when it contracts, it's going to allow you to purse your lips. And when you purse your lips like this, this is going to be called another name for it that we're going to be considering is going to be the kissing muscle. Another name for the orbicular source is going to be the, the kissing muscle. Other muscles that we've seen last time was a muscle that gets its origin from the zygomatic arch, zygomatic bone and process, and it's gonna get inserted down in the angle of the mandible. So when you contract this muscle, you're gonna be pulling on the angle of the mandible. And as I pull on the angle of the mandible, this allows me to smile. So try to imagine on here, those are the angles of your mandible on here. So you pull them like this, you're gonna be smiling. So the smiling muscle here that gets its origin from the zygomatic bone and process and gets inserted down in the angle of the mandible, this is my zygomaticus. I know that here you have two zygomaticus, two zygomaticus muscles, zygomaticus major and minor for us, we're going to consider them as one muscle. This is the zygomaticus. We've seen another muscle that gets its origin from the zygomatic arch as well, but this time it moves down to be inserted in the angle of the mandible. So when I contract this muscle, this is my master. When I contract this muscle, this allows me to pull the mandible up. Remember, this movement of the mandible is called the elevation of the mandible.
All right, so one of the more, one of the strongest muscles in your body is going to be the masseter. It's a mastication muscle. It helps you with the mastication, allowing me to elevate my mandible. Another muscle that you've seen last time was located on the side of your cheeks. And this muscle is called the buccinator muscle or the buccinator. Buccinator or buccinator here is going to be responsible to increase and reduce the pressure within your oral cavity. So if you're chewing, what keeps the food inside the, does not accumulate on one side of your oral cavity between your teeth and your cheeks is the effect of the compression applied by the buccinator. So when you are chewing food, why the food does not accumulate on one side between your teeth and your cheeks? Simply because all the time you're going to be compressing this food between your teeth. All right, so... And this explains why if a person has a paralysis of one of the facial nerves, that gives the innervation to the, to the buccinator muscle, he won't be able to squeeze the food inside the cavity and the food will be accumulating between his teeth and the, his cheek. So the muscle here we've called the buccinator muscle or the buccinator muscle, again, it's going to be responsible to compress the food during chewing. And also, it's going to be allowing suckling and whistling. Another muscle that we've seen last time was a flattened muscle that is located superficial to most of the neck muscles. It gets its origin from the sternum clavicle and the first strip to be inserted up here in the lower margin of my mandible. So I'm traveling all the way up to be inserted in the lower margin of the mandible. This is what we've called the platysma. Platysma is a superficial muscle. It's gonna be responsible to stretch the skin of your neck it also going to be allowing you to pull your mandible down. And if you remember, when you pull the mandible down, we call this movement of the mandible is depression of the mandible. I'm helping with the depression of the mandible. Also, it's going to be responsible for facial expression of the horror and fright. So facial expression of horror and fright, you're going to be contracting the platysma. platysma. So again, again, first muscles that we've seen is my epicranius, anterior part of it is my frontalis, posterior part is my occipitalis muscle. Frontalis is going to be responsible to wrinkle the skin of your forehead. Also, it allows you to elevate your eyebrows. A circular muscle that will be surrounding the eyes that helps with the closure of the eye and help you blink and helps you to blink. This is going to be the orbicularis oculi, another circular muscle, but this time is going to be located around the oral orifice, around the opening of the mouth. This is going to be my orbicularis oris, a muscle that gets its origin from the zygomatic arch and will be inserted in the angle of the mouth. This is gonna be my zygomaticus. Another muscle that will be responsible for the elevation of the mandible during mastication. It's my masseter. It's gonna get its origin, as you see on here, from the zygomatic bone and process to be inserted down in the angle of the mandible. This is my masseter, a muscle that's going to be located in your cheeks. This is going to be the buccinator or buccinator muscle. And again, it's going to be responsible for whistling, suckling, and 
for you to be able to compress the food and for it to not accumulate on one side of your cheeks. Any questions? Any questions so far? Related to the muscles of the head? Any questions? All right, great. So we're looking here at a muscle that we've seen located deeper to the platysma, but this time the muscle gets its origin from the medial one third of the clavicle and the manubrium sterni. It's going to be traveling up and backward to be inserted in the mastoid process of the skull. So we call the muscle on here that gets its origin from the sternum, from the clavicle, and gets inserted in the mastoid process. This is my sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid, from its name, it tells you its attachments. I'm getting my attachments from the sternum, from the clavicle, and I will be inserted in the mastoid process. If you remember the action here of the sternocleidomastoid, I've got two of them. So if I contract one side at a time, so try to imagine on here what you're gonna do if you contract this side, you're pulling the mastoid process on here down towards the manubium. So I would be rotating the head. If I contract only one side, this allows me to rotate my head from side to side. If I contract each side at a time, the head will be rotating from one side to the other. What if you are contracting both sides at the same time. Try to imagine you are pulling the two mastoid processes on here towards your sternum. So I'm pulling the two mastoid processes down towards my sternum. This will allow neck flexion. So again, again, sternocleidomastoid, what's gonna be its action? If you're contracting one side at a time, this allows head rotation from side to side. If you're contracting both sides at the same time, this allows neck flexion. We did also discuss last time a set of muscles that will be responsible for the movements of the arm. If you remember, seeing the muscle of the shoulder here, it has three different parts. Those three parts all together, they will be my deltoid muscle, deltoid muscle. You see on here, I'm getting my origin from the lateral two thirds of the clavicle. I'm getting my origin from the spine of the scapula, from the acromion of the scapula. And I will be inserting the muscle on here down in the lateral part of the shaft of the humerus. So I have a triangular shaped muscle. This is why we called it the deltoid muscle. So if we're looking on here, and deltoid muscles, this is my three different parts of the deltoid muscle. So what's gonna be the main action of, a delt of the deltoid muscle? If we are looking here at the very broad action. So I'm putting this point to move towards my clavicle and scapula. So I'm putting the lateral part of the arm towards my clavicle and scapula. So what action am I performing on here? Contracting the deltoid muscle 
I'm putting here the lateral aspect of, of, of my arm towards my clavicle and scapula. So what action am I performing? I'm moving the arm away from my body. So this is gonna be abduction. Abduction. I'm moving away from the body. So it's an abduction. So the muscle, the prime mover of the abduction of the arm, this is gonna be my deltoid muscle. Deltoid muscle. How about another muscle that will also gonna be moving the arm? You see on here, remember, we call this muscle the pectoralis major. Pectoralis major, pectoral, pectoral related to the chest. And because we have two of them located in the chest, one larger than the other, the large one is what we call the pectoralis major, and the smaller one is what we're going to call the pectoralis minor. So on your list, what you have only, what you are required to know for this upcoming exam is going to be just the pectoralis major. Just the pectoralis major. Pectoralis minor is located deeper to the pectoralis major, so you have to actually remove the major to see the minor. So if we're looking at this muscle, I get my origin from the medial two thirds of the clavicle from the manubrium sterni, body of the sternum. All this is the origin of the muscle, all this. And the fibers gonna be converging together to be inserted in the humerus. So what action do you think am I going to be able to perform? Looking at the insertion on here of the pectoralis major. This is my origin. So when I contract the muscle here, the pectoralis major, what action would I be able to perform? Would I be pulling the arm forward or backward what do you think if this is, i'm 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 moving the humerus towards my sternum so the humerus is going to be moving forward or backward forward and when you move it forward what is the name of the action of the arm in here if you're moving the arm forward so if this is the body like this this is your head this is your arm if you're moving the arm forward, are you increasing or reducing the angle of the joint? I'm reducing the angle, so this is gonna be flexion of the arm, exactly. All right, so what else? You see on here, would I be pulling the humerus when I contract the pectoralis major, would I pull the humerus away from the body or towards my body? What do you think? If you're contracting this muscle, again, what's the contraction of a muscle? You're shortening the length of the muscle. And when you shorten the length of the muscle, what's gonna happen? The two points of attachment gonna get closer to one another. So the humerus is gonna be moving towards my sternum. So I have my arm like this, I'm putting my arm towards my sternum. So what is this movement? What do we call this movement? It's an adduction, exactly. I am performing adduction of the arm, contracting the pectoralis major. So again, again, pectoralis major will be performing both flexion of the arm and adduction of the arm. If you are able to imagine the attachments of the muscle, you would be able to figure out their actions. It's so simple. You need just to visualize you need to imagine how the muscles are attached to the bones and when they are attached to the bones once you figure out what bones are you attached to and how the muscle fibers are traveling you would be able to figure out the movement that results from this muscle contraction so again again we've seen two muscles that will be allowing the movement of the arm one is going to be located in your
shoulder remember on here this is gonna be the deltoid muscle this is my deltoid muscle a triangular shaped muscle that gets its origin from the clavicle from the sternum and will be traveling down to be inserted in the lateral aspect of my humerus it's gonna be when it contracts pulling the arm away from the body so the main action of the deltoid muscle will be arm abduction i'm abducting the arm how about a muscle that gets its origin from the clavicle sternum and will be inserted again in the anterior aspect of the humerus this time so when you contract the muscle you're going to be pulling the arm towards your body so what do we call this movement it's an adduction so what do you think is going to be the relationship here in terms of arm abduction and adduction what is the relationship between the pectoralis major and the deltoid muscle in terms of abduction and adduction of the arm? Are those synergous muscles or they are antagonist muscles? Antagonists. They are antagonists. Why? Because they are opposing each other. They are opposing each other. All right? Moving on to another muscles that we've discussed last, last class. Those were muscles located in the back and they were allowing the movement of the arm as well. So let me check here the trapezius first. Remember, we've seen a, a diamond shaped muscle. This is my trapezius. And if you remember, the trapezius gets its origin from my external occipital protuberance and the mucal lines, as along with the spinous processes of the cervical and the thoracic vertebrae the fibers as you see on here going to be traveling to all of them going to be traveling to be inserted in the superior part of the spine of the scapula remember what was the action here of the muscle it's according to what group of fibers are you talking about are you talking about this group of muscle fibers So those muscle fibers will do what to the scapula? They will be pulling the scapula up towards my head. So what action am I going to be performing here is elevation of the scapula. How about the middle muscle fibers? Middle muscle fibers, when you can get them contracted, they will be pulling the scapula towards your spine. So they are performing retraction of the scap about lower muscle fibers lower muscle fibers are going to be pulling the scapula to rotate like this I mean, imagine this is my scapula like this i am pulling from one side so it starts to rotate see on here is the direction of the muscle fibers I'm putting the scapula, scapula rotates as a result of this contraction. Here I'm allowing the rotation of the scapula. So again, again, what are the actions of the trapezius? If you are fixing the origin, which is the external occipital protuberance, the spinous processes, all this is the origin. If you're fixing the origin, you're not moving the origin, you're moving the scapula, so you can contract the upper muscle fibers to perform elevation of the shoulder you can contract the middle muscle fibers to allow the retraction of the scapulae 
and you can contract the lower muscle fibers to allow the rotation of the scalp. What if I decided to not move my scapula? So I have other muscles that will fix the scapula in its place. So this scapula is not moving. Rather than moving the scapula, I'm fixing the scapula and I will be pulling the external occipital protuberance towards my scapula. So what movement am I allowing in here? If you're pulling the external occipital protuberance backward, it's going to be what action? I'm waiting for some answers on here. If you're pulling the external occipital protuberance backward towards your scapula, it's going to be neck extension. Exactly. Anybody has a problem with how this works? Anybody has a problem with how this works? All right, great. So again, again, see on here, you're fixing the scapula. The scapula is not moving. You're pulling the external occipital protuberance towards the scapula. So you're pulling it this way. And as a result, what's going to happen to the angle of the joint? This is the angle of the joint. Let's say you were flexing your neck like this. Now the angle of the joint would be increased. After you contract the muscle. So increasing the angle of the joint along the sagittal plane is going to be a neck extension. Moving on to another muscle that we've seen last time was the latissimus dorsi or dorsi. Remember, this is a muscle that gets its origin from the sacrum, from the lumbar vertebrae, and from the lower thoracic vertebrae, along with the iliac crest. All this is the origin of the muscle. Muscle fibers are going to be traveling up and forward like this to be inserted looking on here at this muscle. To the anterior aspect of my humerus. You see on here, where am I inserted? I'm inserted in the anterior part of the humerus. So being inserted in the anterior part of the humerus and you're getting your origin from the back. So when I pull on the humerus from this point, I am pulling this point to move down towards my sacrum but it can't move down so what i can allow the arm to perform is a backward movement like this and remember if i am performing this backward movement of the arm if this is the angle of the shoulder joint if i am pulling the arm backward i will be increasing the angle of the joint and if you increase the angle along the sagittal plane this is going to be an arm extension so again again what's going to be the action of the latissimus dorsi is going to be to perform arm extension so what's going to be the relationship between the latissimus dorsi and the pectoralis major. So pectoralis major, remember what's gonna be the action is gonna be responsible to perform arm flexion, forward movement of the arm. That is my dorsi is gonna be putting the arm backward so it allows arm extension. So they are performing opposing actions, we consider them antagonists in terms of 
arm flexion and exception. Prime mover for arm flexion is going to be the pectoralis major. I'm pulling the arm forward. Prime mover for arm extension, I'm pulling the, the arm backwards, going to be my latissimus dorsi. All right, so in terms of abduction and, uh, and uh, in terms of flexion and extension, they are performing opposing actions. They are antagonist muscles. How about in terms of abduction and adduction? What do you think? Here, the latissimus dorsi gets its origin from the midline. So, and it's going to be pulling the humerus towards the midline. So it performs adduction. How about my pectoralis major? Pectoralis major gets its origin from my sternum and gets inserted in the humerus. So it's putting the humerus towards your midline. So both of them are going to be performing adduction. Exactly. Both of them are going to be performing adduction. And if both of them are performing the same action, this means they are adding force to one another. They are, what is the relationship here in terms of abduction and adduction between the uh, pectoralis major and the latissimus dorsi? They are agonist muscles or they are synergists. Synergist muscle is a muscle that adds force to the prime mover or the agonist. All right, the agonist is the prime mover, the muscle that performs most of the effort to allow the movement, a special movement. All right. If I have a muscle that adds force to it, it's going to be a synergist muscle. Other muscles that we've seen last time, I believe those are all the muscles that we've seen last time. We did not discuss the rotator cuff muscles. So another set of muscles that you can see here underneath the latissimus dorsi and the trapezius is going to be a set of muscles that will be directly attaching the scapula to the humerus. So I am removing here the deltoid muscle. I removed the latissimus dorsi and the trapezius. So what I can see on here, I see a muscle that is located above the spine of the scapula. You see on here, it gets its origin from this depression located above the spine of the scapula, and it's going to be traveling to be inserted in the greater tubercle of my humerus, like this. So I'm getting my origin here from all this fossa located above the spine of the scapula to be inserted in the greater tubercle of the humerus. We call this is my supra spinatus supra spinatus supra supra means above i'm located above the spine so we're going to call it supra spinatus muscle about this one what do you what do you think i am located below the spine of the scapula so what do you think we're going to name this muscle if the one above the spine is supraspinatus, so the one below the spine of the scapula is my, exactly as you're writing here, anymore. If the one above the spine of the scapula is supraspinatus, so what do you think we're gonna call the one below the spine of the scapula? It's my, exactly, infraspinates. Infraspinates. So we've got supraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus muscle. We've got teres minor and teres major. I believe we don't have the teres minor as 
or a teres major as one of the muscles that we need to remember for this lab exam. And if I go to the other side of the arm, I remove the anterior muscles. What can I see on here? I see another muscle that gets its origin from below the scapula. So you see on here, this is how the scapula is located in your body. So you see, scapula is not 100%, is not, is not forming a right angle. It's inclined slightly forward. You see on here, it's inclined forward. So yes, this muscle is located anterior to the scapula, but also in the same time as the scapula is inclined slightly forward, it's also located below the scapula. So we call this depression in the scapula, it's my, or we call the muscle here located below the scapula, it's my subscapularis. I am located below the scapula. So again, again, what are the muscles that we're looking at in here? Rotator cuff muscles that are meant mainly to fix to stabilize the shoulder joint, attaching the scapula to the humerus. We've got one located above the spine of the scapula. This is my supraspinatus. We've got one located below the spine of the scapula. We call it infraspinatus. We get a cylindrical shaped muscle. Actually, we've got two cylindrical shaped muscles attaching the scapula to the humerus. One large, one small. So we call the large one, this is my teres major. And the smaller one, cylindrical shaped, smaller muscle that attaches the scapula to the humerus is gonna be my teres minor. So we've got supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres major, and teres minor. How about on the other side of the scapula, below the scapula, because remember, why is it below the scapula? Because the scapula is slightly tilted forward like this. It's not erect. So we're gonna call this is my subscapularis. It's located below the scapula, so we call it subscapularis, below the scapula. Again, again, four rotator cuff muscles that we need to remember one above the spine supraspinatus, one below the spine infraspinatus, a small cylindrical shaped muscle, this is my teres minor, and one located below the scapula, this is gonna be my subscapular. So what do you think is gonna be the common action for those three on here? They are getting their origin from the scapula, and they are inserted in the humerus. So they are trying to pull the humerus towards the midline or away from the midline. One or two, what do you think? If I have a muscle that gets its origin from the scapula and it's inserted in the humerus like this, will it be pulling the humerus towards the midline or away from the midline? towards the midline, right? So what do we call the movement on here of the arm? If I'm pulling the arm towards the midline, is this gonna be an adduction, exactly. I'm performing adduction of the arm. Why I didn't mention the supraspinatus on here? Look here at the supraspinatus, it doesn't trouble behind or in front of the humerus. It travels above the humerus like this. So when I pull the greater tubercle of the humerus, this point, I pull it towards the scapula. What's gonna be the action here? If I'm pulling this elevated part of the humerus towards my scapula, so I'm pulling like this, boom, boom, Boom. I'm pulling the 
elevated part from above, not in the front, not passing in front or behind the humerus. So I am traveling here, I am putting the humerus like this. So this is my midline. I'm putting the humerus slightly away from the midline. So slightly away from the midline, it's gonna be abduction, exactly. So you see on here why the supraspinatus is, is special because of where it's gonna be traveling. Supraspinatus is traveling above my humerus. So when you are traveling above the humerus, not behind, not anterior to the humerus, and you pull on the greater tubercle, you're trying to pull the greater tubercle to move towards your scapula in the same direction of the fibers. So the arm on here is gonna be pulled to move away from your midline. It's moving away from your body. So it's gonna be considered an abductor. So again, again, we're looking here as the rotator cuff muscles, the main action for all of them together is gonna be to perform a stabilization of the shoulder joint, especially because the head of the humerus is gonna be articulating with a very shallow cavity, which is a glenoid cavity. So shoulder joint is gonna be much easier to dislocate compared to something like the hip joint. So I need a lot of muscles to stabilize the joint. So again, again, rotator cuff muscle is going to be stabilizing the shoulder joint and will act as extra capsular reinforcement. Moving on to another group of muscles. This time they are located in the arm, allowing them to move the forearm. So this time we're looking at the muscles of the arm that would be allowing the movement of the forearm. This includes a muscle located in the anterior aspect of the fore of the arm. This is gonna be a muscle with two heads located in the arm. So we're gonna call it the biceps brachii. Why do, why, why do we call it biceps brachii? Bi has two seps origins or heads. So it has two origins. Where the biceps brachii gets its origins? See on here, look at the scapula on here. Do you remember What did we call this? Process coming out from the scapula. If you remember in the scapula, we've seen two processes. One that will be the continuation of the spine. This was the acromion. And we've seen one located anterior to the acromion. This was my here. Coracoid process, exactly, Najib. Coracoid process. So first origin, first origin for the muscles is gonna be the coracoid process of the scap. This is for my short head of, of the biceps. Compared to the long head, the long head gets its origin from above the glenoid cavity. You see on here, this point is the origin of the long head. So why do we call this is the short, this is the long head? Because of, of the length, you see on here, they are both inserted down at the same point. If one is getting its origin here from the coracoid process and the other one is getting its origin from above the glenoid cavity, this one has to travel around the humerus This one travels down directly to fuse with the other head. So the one that will be traveling down directly to fuse with the other head is gonna be my short head. 
compared to the ones that would be traveling around the humerus to reach the anterior aspect of the of the arm this is going to be my lung head so again again biceps brachii has two heads one is coming from is getting its origin from the coracoid process and the other one is getting its origin from the glenoid cavity glenoid cavity the ones that gets its origin from the glenoid cavities is going to be the long head of the biceps the ones that gets its origin from the coracoid process is going to be my short head of the biceps both heads will be fusing together and with a single tendon they will be inserted down in the radial tuberosity you see on here this is my radius this is my radius and this protruding part on the inside of the radius this is going to be my radial tuberosity so what do you think is going to be the action here of the biceps breaker first what joints am I passing or am I related to? First, I am passing in front of the shoulder joint. So if I shorten the muscle that travels in front of the shoulder joint, what action would I be performing on the shoulder? Flexion. I'm passing in front of the shoulder joint, so when I contract the muscle, I am helping with the flexion of the arm. Flexion of the shoulder, flexion of the arm at the shoulder joint. Also, I'm traveling in front of the elbow joint to be inserted in the radius. So traveling in front of the elbow joint. So when I contract, I would be reducing or increasing the angle of the joint. If I am passing in front of the elbow, I'm reducing the angle. So what action would I be performing? What action would I be performing? Again, flexion of the forearm at the elbow. So passing in front of the, of the shoulder, passing in front of the elbow will allow both flexion of the shoulder, flexion of the elbow. Flexion of both elbow and elbow and shoulder joint if you remember how the radius did look like I add If I'm adding here, I'm drawing the radius, the ulna, and the humor. So remember this, how they look like. This is my lateral part. This is my medial part. We've got the trochlea. We've got the capitulum. On here, this is my capitulum. This is my trochlea. Remember, what was articulating with the capitulum was the head of the radius, like this. And the ulna was articulating to the trochlea of the humerus and remember the part of the of the ulna that articulates with the trochlea of the humerus was my trochlear notch so this is how they looked like if you remember so if i'm telling you that this muscle here i'm drawing it in blue is inserted down like this both heads of the biceps brachii are inserted down in my radial tuberosity. So if you contract the biceps, you're first going to be pulling the radius towards your humerus, which will allow flexion of the forearm. 
as we did mention earlier. But what else? I'm trying to pull here the radius, not only forward to perform the flexion, but also I'm trying to pull it medially. Pulling the radius to move medially, what action will it be allowing? Remember, if you are pulling the radius here to rotate not around its own axis, but, uh, but around the axis of the ulna. We don't call it rotation. Why we don't call it rotation? Because it's not a rotational movement around my own axis. Remember, in order to say that you are rotating the head, the head is moving around its own axis. If I'm saying rotation of the arm, it's a rotation of the arm around its own axis. But here, the radius is not rotating around its own axis. It's rotating around the ulna. Remember, yes, exactly. I am pulling the radius, which is the lateral bone, to rotate around the ulna, flipping my hand like this. This is pronation, pronation. You see on here, if this is your thumb, like this. So when you are rotating this part of your forearm here, so rather than being like this, it's gonna be moving like this. And as a result, what's gonna happen? Your thumb is gonna be pulled like this. And this is gonna be the back of your hand, allowing you to pronate your hand. So allowing pronation. So again, again, what is the, what are the actions that I can see on here for the biceps brachii? Again, why do we call it the biceps brachii? Because it has two hands and it is located in the arm. Seeing a short head that gets its origin from the coracoid process of my uh, scapula. Long head is getting its origin from the glenoid cavity of the scapula and both going to be inserted by a single tendon down in the radial tuberosity. Remember, passing in front of the shoulder, in front of the elbow, I am allowing flexion of both shoulder and the elbow joint. Being inserted in the radial tuberosity of the radius, getting it, my origin from a medial point, this will allow the rotation of the radius around the ulna, allowing the pronation of the hand to take place. So what action would I be performing here as a biceps brachii? I'm performing flexion of the shoulder, flexion of the elbow, and pronation. So if you go to the gym, what are what is the best exercise that you can do for the biceps? Flexion, you flex, 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 flex your elbow, but I'm not sure of the name of uh, the, the, the zigzag bar. If you remember, if you go to the gym, you're gonna have not just a straight bar like this, like something that is zigzag. I'm not sure, Any anybody goes to the gym, knows what is the name of this bar? Easy bar, exactly, yeah, easy bar. Easy bar on here, so why easy bar is gonna be good for exercising the biceps because I'm not only performing flexion of the elbow, I'm also performing a pronation in the same time. I'm performing flexion and pronation in the same time. All right, so for me to activate for me to activate more muscle fibers of the biceps brachii, I'm not only performing flexion, I'm performing flexion and 
pronation, in a semi-pronated uh, position of, of the head. All right, any questions? Any questions so far? Any questions? All right, so we can have a break for, for 10. We come back, uh, discuss the muscles of the forearm and the triceps brachii. All right, we can have a break for 10. We come back, discuss more about the muscles. All right, we'll see you in 10.
All right, so welcome back. All right, so we're looking here at another muscle. And this time in the posterior aspect of the arm that will be affecting the arm. As a movement of the forearm, this is going to be my triceps brachii. So why do we call it the triceps brachii? Because simply it has three heads and it's located in the arm. So looking here at the model, you can see a long head that gets its origin from the scapula. and two heads that will get their origin from the shaft of the humerus. So for the triceps, we don't have a long and a short head, but we do have long head and the one which is the most superficial on the lateral side this is gonna be my lateral head of the triceps and the one which is located deeper to it, this is going to be my medial head. So again, again, three heads of the triceps that we're looking at. First one here, this is going to be the long head of the triceps. Again, it gets its origin from the scapula. This is my long head. On the lateral side, we have a superficial muscle. So this is going to be the lateral head and deeper to it, you've got the medial head. So again, again, three muscles or three heads of the triceps brachii. We've got long head, lateral head, and if I remove the lateral head, you're gonna see deeper to it, this is gonna be my medial head of the triceps brachii. You see, all the three heads are gonna be inserted by a single tendon to this part of the ulna. If you remember, what do we call this bony eminence in the posterior aspect of the ulna? This pointed bony part is my olecranon process, exactly, olecranon process. So all the three heads of my triceps brachii are gonna be inserted down in the olecranon process of my ulna. So what are the different joints that you are related to as a triceps brachii? First, what are the joints that I'm related to? I'm related to the shoulder. I'm related to the elbow. Is there any other joints? What do you think? That you can see the triceps is related to? other than the shoulder and the elbow joints. No, so those are the only two joints that I'm related to. Here, is the triceps passing in front or behind the shoulder? What do you see on here? Am I passing in front or behind the shoulder joint? I'm passing behind the shoulder. So what action would I be allowing on the shoulder? If this is my head like this, and this is my shoulder, this is my arm. And I have a muscle that travels behind the arm. So when it contracts, you're gonna be pulling the arm backward or forward? Backward, and uh, we call this going to be an arm extension. So here's the triceps brachii as it passes behind the arm, it's going to be performing arm extension or shoulder extension. How about my elbow joint? Am I passing in front or behind the elbow? I'm passing behind the elbow. So when I perform an action on the elbow joint, what's gonna be the action if I'm passing behind the elbow joint? When I contract this muscle on here, pulling the olecranon 
process of the ulna towards my humerus. So I am moving the forearm backward. And as I move the forearm backward, what's going to happen to the angle of my elbow joint is going to be increased. And an increase in the angle is going to be a forearm extension. Exactly. So triceps brachii is passing behind the shoulder, behind the elbow, so it performs extension of both shoulder and elbow joints. Moving on to the muscles of the forearm that will be allowing the movement of the wrist, the wrist joint. So look first at the anterior aspect of the forearm. So having a muscle located in the anterior aspect of the forearm, what do you think? Would it be performing a flexion or an extension of my wrist joint? I'm located in the anterior aspect. So when I pull on the wrist, when I pull on the hand, will I be performing flexion of the wrist or extension of the wrist? If I'm passing in front of the wrist joint. So when I contract, I'm pull, I am pulling the hand like this. So what action am I performing on here? It's gonna be action on the wrist, action on the wrist. If the muscle is located in the anterior aspect of the forearm, What do you think? Flexion, extension, what do you think? If I'm looking on here, this is my forearm. And this is my wrist joint. So, if I'm located in the anterior aspect here, when I contract pulling on this part, will I be performing flexion? or will I be performing extension? If I'm pulling on this part, on this point, to move towards my origin, will I be performing one flexion or two extension? Flexion, exactly. So you see on here, you're pulling the wrist joint towards the anterior aspect of the forearm, allowing the flexion of the wrist. So what do you think we're going to name the muscle on here on the anterior or the muscles in the anterior aspect of the forearm? Are those flexors? Are those going to be flexors or extensors? What do you think? If I have a muscle on here, this diagram is not highly accurate here. So let's see this muscle. Would this muscle be a flexor or an, an extensor? If it's located in the anterior aspect, it's going to be a flexor muscle. So looking at the muscle, if you see it in the anterior aspect, this is going to mean that it's a flexor muscle. And what part are you trying to move in here? You're trying to move the wrist joint. So I am performing flexion of my wrist. So I will call the muscle here 
it's a flexor carpi. And where's the tendon? Can you see on here is the tendon of the muscle? Where's the tendon is directed? Is it directed laterally or medially? How would you tell whether it's lateral or medial? Look at what? Thumb. So if you're going towards the thumb, the thumb in an anatomical position, thumb is lateral or medial? A thumb is lateral. So if you see on here, the tendon is going towards the thumb. So this means I'm going towards the lateral side. And what, what bone was it, the lateral bone of the forearm? You remember? The radius or the ulna was the lateral bone of the forearm? radius right so if i am going towards the lateral side this means i will be directed towards my thumb and if i'm going toward the thumb i will be a lateral muscle so i'm, I'm pulling on the lateral side i am related to the radius so we're going to name the muscle here it's my Flexor. Why is it flexor? Because it performs flexion as it is located in the anterior aspect of the forearm. It's performing flexion of what? It's performing flexion of your wrist joint. So, and something related to the wrist is called carpi. And its tendon is directed laterally. It's traveling laterally away from the midline. So, the, the lateral side is related to the radius, so we're going to call it a radialis. So what's the name of the muscle on here that we're looking at? It's my flexor carpi radialis. From the name, you can know first location, attachment, action, and the direction of the test. So if I see this muscle on the test, and I'm asking you to identify the muscle, what do you think is gonna be, how would I be thinking to answer this question? I look, is this anterior or posterior first? How would I tell? Look whether you see this bone or not. If you don't see, the olecranon process of the ulna. This means you're looking at the anterior aspect of the forearm. So knowing that this is the anterior aspect, this is going to be a flexor. So I know flexor. And I'm going with one tendon. This means I'm going to be moving just the wrist, the wrist joint. So it's going to be flexor carpi. And this tendon, is it directed towards my thumb or away from the thumb? Is it going laterally or medially? It's going laterally. So if I'm traveling laterally, so I will be the, on the same side as the radius. So it's going to be a radialis muscle. So again, again, what can I understand from the name? It's called my flexor carpi. A radialis performs flexion of the wrist and it's directed towards the thumb. It's going, it's traveling laterally. All right, so what are the actions do you think of this muscle called flexor carpi radialis? It performs flexion of what? Of the wrist joint. What else? I am pulling on the lateral point on here. So put your hand like this, hold your thumb and pull on your thumb. Pull on your thumb. What movement am I performing? 
I am pulling my hand away from the midline or towards my midline. What do you think? In an anatomical position like this. Hold your thumb, pull your thumb. So you will see the hand is pulled away from the midline. This is an abduction or adduction. What do you think? If you're pulling away, if you're pulling away from the midline, away, away, away. Remember, if you're putting towards, if you're pulling towards your body, you're adding your arms to your body. It's an abduction. Remember, if you're moving towards the midline, you're moving towards the body, this is an adduction. If you're moving away, away from your body, away from the midline, it's an abduction. All right, so again, again, what is another action here of a muscle called flexor carpi radialis? I'm performing flexion of the wrist. I am also radialis, means what? Means I am putting on the hand to move away from the midline. So I'm performing abduction. Exactly, ab, b, 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 b baby. B for baby, all right? Ab, b, 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 duction. All right, I am pulling the hand away from the midline. It's gonna be an abduction of the hand. So again, again, what are the actions here of a muscle that is called flexor carpi radialis? I am performing flexion of the wrist, not only flexion of the wrist, I am pulling the hand away from the midline. It's an abduction of the hand. So general rule, when you see radialis, it tells you that you're going to the lateral side. And if you're going towards the lateral side to be inserted, you're gonna be pulling the hand away from the midline. In other words, you're performing abduction. Easy, easy. Anybody is confused here? All good, all good. All right, so first muscles that we're looking at here in the forearms, this is my flexor carpi radialis so looking here at our 3d model a muscle with a single tendon going to be inserted towards my thumb i'm going towards the thumb i'm going towards the thumb so it's going to be my Flexor carpi radialis. Flexor carpi radialis. How about this? muscle see it's getting its origin from the back and it's going to get inserted in the back of the hand of the of the wrist so would it be a flexor or an extensor although you do see most of the muscle in the anterior aspect but where do i get my origin where do i get inserted it's on the posterior part. You see on here, this is the point of insertion of the muscle. This is the point of origin. So will it be an extensor or a flexor? If you am getting my origin from the back, I'm inserted in the back, it's gonna be an extensor, extensor muscle. So 
here, what am I performing the extension of? I'm inserted in the carpal bones. So I will, my action is gonna be only affecting the wrist joint. So I'm gonna be called extensor and something related to the wrist joint is called carpi, exactly. Where is, am I inserted? Am I inserted on the same side or the opposite side of the thumb? See this muscle here? It's on the same side as, as the thumb. So it's gonna be lateral or medial. If it's on the same side as the thumb, it's gonna be lateral. And can you remind me please, what was the name of the lateral bone of the forearm? Radius. So can you name this muscle for me without looking at the name? I am a muscle located in the back, affecting the wrist and traveling on the same side as the thumb, on the lateral side. So having a muscle that is traveling on the posterior aspect of the forearm is gonna be extensor. What are you performing the extension for? It's gonna be extension of the wrist. So it's gonna be extensor carpi. And I am traveling on the same side as the thumb is going to be a radialis, a radialis. So what do we name this muscle again? It's going to be my extensor carpi radialis. But you see, all what we've mentioned will be applied on this, on the, uh, on this other muscle on here. So what we will do? So it's an extensor. It's going to be traveling on the dorsal aspect of the forearm. It has a single tendon affecting only my wrist. And it's also traveling on the same side as the thumb. So here we're going to be using the comparative, the relative size of the muscle. So here, this is an extensor carpi radialis. Also, this one on here is going to be an extensor carpi radialis. So what we're gonna call this one, the one which is longer, we're gonna call it extensor carpi radialis longus. And the one with the shorter in length, we're gonna call it extensor carpi radialis brevis longest it's longer in length brevis it's shorter in length all right so again again what we're looking at in here we're looking at a muscle that will be traveling on the dorsal aspect gets its origin from the dorsal aspect gets inserted in the dorsal aspect it has a single tendon that will be inserted in the carpal bones and it's gonna be on the same side as the thumb. But as this will be applied to more than one muscle, we're gonna differentiate them according to their length. So what do we call the longer muscle on here that has those characteristics? This is my extensor carpi radialis and don't forget longus all right so extensor carpi radialis longus this is going to be the muscle on here with a single tendon on the dorsal aspect of the forearm getting inserted in the carpet bones again going towards the thumb How about this muscle on here? This muscle is located on the dorsal aspect. Dorsal aspect. All 
But this time it doesn't have a single tendon. You see on here, I have one, two, three, four tendons. So I'm not going only towards the wrist joint. I'm also, I'm going to be affecting not only the wrist joint, I'm also going to be affecting the fingers. So am I first an extensor or a flexor? If I'm located here, if I'm locating the muscle on the dorsal aspect of the forearm, this tells me it's an extensor or a flexor. This muscle on here, will it be an extensor or a flexor? Extensor, exactly. Extensor. Am I only affecting the wrist joint for, for it to be called carpi or I'm affecting the fingers? Having four tendons, four tendons. Am I only affecting the wrist joint or I have an action affecting the fingers? Fingers, right? Fingers. Anybody doesn't agree with me, looking at the muscle on here, having four tendons going to the medial four fingers, I will be affecting the fingers. So what do we call something related to the fingers? Finger, remember? The technology that we use our fingers to perform the task, it's called digital. So here is a muscle that will be affecting the fingers or having a, an action when it contracts on the fingers. So it's gonna be digitorum. So a muscle that is located on the posterior side of the forearm is extensor and it has four tendons going to the medial four fingers. This is gonna be my extensor digitorum extensor i'm looking on the dorsal aspect i will be performing extension of the fingers you see on here when you ex when you perform extension of your fingers you can see the tendons on the back of your hand those are the tendons of which muscle my extensor digitor extensor digitor How about this muscle? I am located on the dorsal aspect, so what is the first word I will be using here to name the muscle? Am I a flexor or an extensor if I'm located on the dorsal aspect on here? Located on the dorsal aspect, it's gonna be an extensor, exactly. And I have a single tendon or more than one tendon? One tendon or more than one tendon? See on here. Do I have a single tendon or four tendons going to the fingers? I have a single tendon. And single tendon means I'm only going to be affecting the rest of the joint, not the fingers so i am related to the wrist joint so it's gonna be carpi can you check the direction of the of the tendon on here am i inserted on the same side or the opposite side to the thumb i'm on the opposite side or the same side as the thumb where is this tendon directed? Is it directed away from the thumb or towards your thumb? It's going away from the thumb means on the medial or lateral aspect, medial aspect. It's going away from the thumb. It's on this medial aspect. So, it's gonna be related to which bone of the forearm? Which bone is the medial bone of the forearm? We've seen the radi radius, what, which was the lateral bone. Which one is the medial bone of the forearm? This will be my ulna, exactly. So what do we call this muscle? We're gonna call it my extensor carpi 
Al Nares. Again, extensor carpi al Nares. This is the muscle on here. Extensor carpi al Nares. I have a muscle located on the dorsal aspect. It's an extensor. It has a single tendon. So it's carpi and it's going to be inserted away from the thumb. It's going to be medial, directed medially. It's going to be al Nares. So what do you think? What's going to be the action of this muscle? It performs extension of the wrist. What else? I want you this time to hold your pinky and pull on your pinky. So what movement of the hand are you performing? Are you pulling your hand toward, towards your midline or away from the midline? I'm pulling the hand. If I'm pulling the little finger, the hand is pulled towards my midline. So it's going to be an adduction, 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 exactly. So again, again, what are the four muscles that we need to remember here in the forearm? We've got one, which is the flexor, flexor carpi radialis. From the name, you can't tell its action. From the name, you can tell the appearance and location. Flexor muscle is going to be on the anterior aspect of the forearm. Carpi, I know that it's not affecting the finger, so it's going to have one ten tendon. Radialis is going to be directed towards the lateral side. How would I figure out the lateral side? From the thumb. So what action would I be performing? I'm performing flexion of the wrist, abduction of the hand abduction i'm moving away from the midline on the posterior aspect we've seen three muscles extensor carpi radialis longus again how would i be able to identify this see a muscle long tendon traveling on the dorsal aspect and remember on the same side as your thumb so it's going to be extensor carpi radialis but remember you've got two of them extensor carpi radialis one is longer than the others the one that we're concerned with is going to be the longer one so we're going to call the longer one is extensor carpi radialis longus we've seen another muscle this time the muscle has four tendons, not a single tendon. So it's going to be extensor digitorum. What actions would that be allowing? It allows extension of the wrist joint. I'm traveling behind the wrist. Also, I will be performing extension of the metacarpal phalangeal joints along with the interphalangeal joints and performing extension of the fingers another muscle that we've seen in the dorsal aspect of the of the forearm it's a muscle with a single tendon on the dorsal aspect and the tendon is going to be directed towards the medial side away from the thumb so it's going to be extensor carpi Alnaris, not radialis. Alnaris. Alnaris. Any questions? Any questions? Any problem with those four muscles that we need to know in the four R? All right, great, great, great. All right, so moving on to another set of muscles. This time, we're looking at the muscles of the abdominal wall. You see on here a muscle which is located superficial to the rest of the abdominal muscles. 
is this gonna be a muscle which fibers are traveling in an oblique angle what if I remove the muscle on here I will see another muscle which fibers are traveling again in an oblique angle so what will I call those muscles one on the outside which fibers are traveling oblique and one on the inside so we're gonna call the outside the most superficial muscle is gonna be my external oblique external oblique it's on the outside compared to the one located deeper to it is going to be my internal oblique so you've got two oblique muscles in the abdominal wall one is superficial one is deep superficial muscle is going to be external oblique deeper muscle which fibers are traveling in an oblique pattern is this going to be my internal oblique muscle on the same level as the internal oblique muscle we're going to have a muscle which fibers are traveling straight a straight muscle what do we call a straight muscle it's a rectus recta remember recta means straight so we have the straight muscle here of the abdomen where it doesn't get its origin from it gets its origin from the coastal cartilages along with the xiphoid process of the sternum and the lower part the lower portion of the uh, body of the sternum to be inserted down here if you remember what do we call this bone and joint this is my pubic bone and if you remember the joint that gets formed on here between the two pubic bones this is my pubic symphysis or the symphysis pubis exactly so we're looking here a straight muscle in the abdomen we're going to call it rectus abdominis rectus abdominis those are your six packs there are eight actually not six So we've got the most superficial muscle here. This is my external oblique muscle. When I remove it again, deeper to it, you're going to have internal obliques. And on the same level, we've got two straight muscles of the abdomen. Those are my recti or the rectus abdominis if you see on here attaching the two recti to one another we've got this thick connective tissue that will be attaching them it looks like a white line connecting the two recti white line so what do we call the white line connecting the two recti we call it the white line all right surprise white line or in other words linea alba linea linea means line and alba alba means white so again again what do we call the white line connecting the two recti white line linear alba uh, in espanol i'm not exactly sure but the uh latin yeah linear linear uh, Spaniel less. Uh, Italian, Spanish, 
are very close to the Latin portion, right? Compared to the English, English is much more different than the Latin origin of the words. All right, so Spanish, uh, Italian are closer to the Latin, uh, which is the or origin of those names. All right, like albino, you know albino, albino, I don't have skin pigmentation. I don't have any pigments, so linea, alba, again, white, line in, it might be common, it's going to be similar in Spanish, it's similar in Italian, but again, the origin of the word is going to be Latin origin, exactly. All right, so again, again, what we're looking at in here, we're looking at one muscle, which fibers are traveling in an oblique, at an, an oblique angle, located on the outside. This is my external oblique. One underneath it, which fibers are traveling in an oblique angle, deeper to it, this is gonna be my internal oblique. A muscle which fibers are traveling straight down, a straight muscle is going to be rectus. So the rectus of the abdomen is rectus abdominis. And the two recti muscles, again, are connected by a white line, linea alba. It's a connective tissue that attaches the two recti muscles together. If I remove here the internal oblique muscle, I will see a muscle which fibers are traveling in a horizontal pattern. You see on here, muscle which fibers are traveling horizontally like this. This is gonna be my transversus abdominis. Transverse muscle of the abdomen is my transversus abdominis. So again, again, what muscles are forming the abdominal wall? We've got external oblique muscle. It's going to be external oblique. Underneath it, we've got internal oblique. And on the same level, we've got rectus abdominis. And the two recti muscles are attached by the linea alba underneath the recti and the internal oblique muscle. We've got a muscle that will. Which, which fibers are traveling in a horizontal pattern, this is gonna be my transversus abdominis. All right, so what are is gonna be the action of those muscles? If we're looking at external oblique, external oblique, or this is internal, those are internal oblique, so I can remove that one. We can add external oblique. So where do I get the origin? Where do I get the insertion? You see on here, this is my point of origin and this is gonna be the point of insertion. Those are my attachments on here. So I'm trying to pull this point towards this point. So what is the movement I will be performing here? I'm performing flexion of the spine, exactly. I'm performing flexion of the spine and a rotation, flexion and rotation. So you can pull this point towards this point. You can pull this point towards this point, the same concept. I'm performing flexion of the spine. I'm reducing the angle of the spine and I will be performing rotation of the spine. What am I mostly concerned with is gonna be the rotation. I have a very wide angle. 
that those fibers are traveling in so i allow more rotation how about something like this here the rectus abdominis i am pulling the chest towards my pelvis so what action would i be performing boom boom flexion of the spine flexion of the spine and if i'm contracting one side at a time what's going to happen i will allow some rotation as well but i have a, a narrow angle of the uh, for the rotation so both external oblique and the rectus abdominis going to be performing both flexion of the spine and the rotation of the spine but who is going to be more concerned with flexion who's going to be performing more of the flexion it's going to be your i'm waiting for some answers external oblique external oblique who's going to mainly concerned with the flexion part here flexion of the spine Yeah, some more answers. I'm waiting. Yeah, two, three, yes. Any other ideas? rectus abdominis so again again both external oblique and the rectus abdominis is going to be performing both flexion and rotation of the spine external oblique is going to be performing more of the rotation uh, rectus abdominis is going to be performing more of the flexion of the spine All right, how about the transversus abdominis? So here I have a muscle which fibers are traveling in a horizontal pattern. Like this. So what is the action here? When you contract the transversus abdominis, what action are you expecting to get here? Having a muscle which fibers are traveling in a transverse pattern like this. So when you contract, you are pulling everything in you're not going to be performing flexion or extension you are compressing the abdominal organs inside compression of the abdominal organs inside the abdominal cavity i'm compressing so what happens if a person has weakened transversus abdominis if a person has multiple abdominal surgeries or he has uh, other risk factors i might have herniation part of the intestines for example is traveling out i have a skin pouch coming out that contains intestines but who is supposed to prevent this from taking place who is supposed to pull the intestines and other abdominal organs in compressing them inside the abdominal cavity this is going to be my transversus abdominis questions questions any questions all good all right so let's have another short break short break for five minutes we're going to come back discuss the muscles of the lower limb so we'll see you in five five minutes we're going to have a break i will put the time the timer on in here and we'll see you in five minutes
All right, so welcome back. So now we're moving on to the muscles of the lower limb. Starting first with the set of muscles that will be getting their origin from the pelvic bones and will be inserted in the femur. First big muscle in the gluteal regions is gonna be the gluteus maximus. If you see on here, the action of the gluteus maximus. I'm getting my origin, like what you see on here, from the sacrum, from the coccyx, and from the iliac bone. And the trowels to be inserted down here in the tract, a fibrous tract that will be going towards my fibula. So here, what joint am I related to? I'm related to the hip joint. I'm traveling behind the hip joint. So as the muscle contracts, it pulls on the femur to move backward. So what is the action that I would be performing in this case? What is the angle of the hip joint? The angle of the hip joint is located anterior in the front. So when I pull the femur to move backward, this is an flexion or an extension. What do you think? Again, again, looking here at the gluteus maximus. This is where I get my origin from. I will be inserted partly in the femur and part in the tract that travels down towards my fibula. So this muscle, when it contracts, pulling the femur backward like this. So let's say this is my femur now after I contract the muscle. The angle of the, of the joint is anterior. See on here, what happens when you pull the femur backward to the angle of the joint? Did you increase the angle of the joint or did you reduce the angle of the joint? What do you think? Pulling the femur backward did increase the angle of the joint. And when you increase the angle of the joint, what do we call this movement along the sagittal plane? It's gonna be Extension or flexion? Extension, exactly. So here I'm performing extension of my thigh at the hip joint. Extension of the thigh at the hip is gonna be the action of the gluteus maximus. The prime mover here for thigh extension. If I remove the gluteus maximus, underneath it, you're gonna have the gluteus medius. And as you see on here, gluteus medius gets its origin from the iliac bone. And will be inserted down here in my greater trochanter. So what do you think is gonna be the main action on here? What this muscle looks like in the upper limb? A triangular shaped muscle that gets inserted in the lateral aspect. This looks like what muscles that we've seen in the upper limb? Like the deltoid muscle. So when you pull on the greater trochanter, this will allow the femur to move away or towards your midline. What do you think? 
would you be pulling if you I'm pulling on the greater to canter I'm pulling the greater to canter like this would I be pull, allowing the femur to move away from the midline or towards the midline this is my midline on here when I pull at this point on this point I will be pulling the femur to move away from the midline so what is the action on here I am the prime mover for thigh abduction I'm performing abduction of the thigh at the hip joint abduction of the thigh at the hip joint moving on to another group of muscles that will allow the movement of the thigh this group of muscles is called my adductor muscle group and from its name from the name here of the of this group what's going to be the main action what the, they would be performing what do you think adduction i am the adductor muscle group it's going to be an adduction so if you notice on here all those muscles will have a uh, their origin coming from my pubic bone and they will be inserted down in the shaft of the femur. So let me remove this here. A group of muscles on here, they get their origin from the pubic bone and they will be inserted in the shaft of the femur. So we call those are my adductor muscle group, adductor muscle group. So how would I name those muscles? So on a diagram, uh, on a model like this, remember you have four of them, four of them. Me. Look at this one on here. So again, again, the adductor muscle group has four muscles starting from medial side, from the medial side, from the midline. First muscle here is called my gracilis muscle. Gracilis muscle. Comes next my adductor magnus. Adductor magnus. Comes next my adductor longus. And then my pectineus. So we've got here four muscles, gracilis, adductor magnus, adductor longus, and pectineus. This is not, this is not the quadriceps. This is not the quadriceps. Here we're looking at the adductor muscle group. We've got how many muscles again? We've got one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, four. One, two, th three, four. This is my adductor muscle group. Again, how would I remember the names on here? Remember, between the two thighs, we've got a gap. G, A, A, P. So G, a a p gap g a a p so from inside out we go gracilis adductor magnus adductor longus and finally pectinus
G A A P G A A P. This is gap between the two thighs. G A A P. So if you're looking at this diagram, it's a regular diagram. We're looking here. See how comes this is called the adductor magnus. I see only a very small muscle. Actually, you can see a very small part of the actual muscle. If we're looking here, this is my adductor magnus. All this is my adductor magnus. So if I removed the surrounding muscles, kept removing them just to look at the adductor magnus. All this is my adductor magnus. Can you see how big it is? This is my adductor magnus, adductor magnus. Comes next is going to be the adductor. If you're looking here without removing any of the muscles, the adductor group. First, we've got gracilis muscle. Adductor magnus, adductor longus, and pectinus. If I remove the adductor longus, I will have another one which is shorter in length. That's why we call it adductor brevis. So again, again, from inside out, we've got gracilis, adductor magnus, adductor longus, and pectinus. So what do you think is going to be the action of those muscles? First obvious action is going to be they are pulling the femur, see on here, towards my midline. So what is the action on here? I'm pulling the thigh towards the midline. This is an adduction of the thigh. I am pulling the thigh towards the midline. I am performing an adduction. What else? What else? See on here. Let's say the pectineus, pectineus muscle, adductor longus. If you're looking here, are, is the origin located anterior or posterior to the insertion? What do you think? I'm inserted in the femur. I'm getting my origin from the pubic bone. So when I try to move the femur towards the pubic bone, will the thigh be moving forward or backwards? forward. So when I move the thigh forward, is this a flexion or an extension? What do you think? If I'm looking at the side view again here, see this is the origin of the muscle. This is the insertions that you can see on here embedded between the muscles. So you're going to be pulling with the femur to move forward. This allows you to reduce the angle of the joint. It's a flexion. What else can I be performing on here? If you see on here, I'm putting the femur, which is located lateral, towards the pubic bone, which is more medial. So this allows me to perform a rotational movement of the thigh. I am rotating the femur around its own axis. So is this going to be a medial rotation or a lateral rotation? Which one do you think? One, medial rotation or two, lateral rotation? If I'm putting the femur to rotate around its own axis, pulling it from the pubic bone. So this allows media rotation of the thigh. Exactly. Media rotation of the thigh. 
So again, again, what are the main actions that you can mention on here for the adductor muscle group? Again, they share most of those actions. Gracilis muscle, adductor magnus, adductor longus, and pectineus. This is a group of muscles that we call the adductor muscle group. All of them are going to be performing adduction of the thigh. They are pulling the thigh towards the midline. Some of them are going to be passing in front of the hip joint, like the pectineus, adductor longus, and part of the adductor magnus. So they are helping with the flexion of the thigh. They are getting their origin from the pubic bone inserted in the femur. This allows the femur to rotate around its own axis, moving towards the midline. It's my medial rotation. Medial rotation. So again, again, what are the muscles that we've seen so far allowing the movement of the thigh? We've seen gluteus maximus. Underneath it, we've seen gluteus medius. Adductor muscle group, again, you've got a gap, G, A, A, P. Gracilis, adductor magnus, adductor longus, and pectinus. Any questions, questions, questions? All right, so moving on to the muscles in the thigh that will be allowing the movement of the leg. So first we're starting with the anterior compartment of the thigh. In the anterior compartment of the thigh, we've got a muscle with four heads or actually four muscles that will fuse together. This is what we call the quadriceps Femoris. So all this is my quadriceps muscle. All this is my quadriceps muscle. All right, so looking at the quadriceps femoris, what we can see on here. We can see a long muscle that travels straight along the thigh. So we're gonna call it the straight muscle of the thigh. It's called my rectus femoris. Remember, the straight muscle of the abdomen is what we've called the rectus abdominis. Here, the straight muscle of the thigh is gonna be my rectus femoris. On both sides, of the rectus femoris, we've got two vasti, one on the medial side, one on the lateral side. A vastus, vast, vast means wide, large. So we've got large muscles on here, one on the medial side, one on the lateral side, one towards the midline, one away from the midline. So we're gonna call the one on the medial side, this is my vastus medialis, and the one on the lateral side, this is gonna be my vastus Laterals. What is the fourth muscle? I need to remove first the rectus femoris for it to appear between the two vasti deeper to the rectus femoris. So we've got a vastus muscle located between the vastus medialis and the vastus laterals. This is my vastus intermedius. So again, again, four muscles on here that will be forming the anterior compartment of the thigh. This is going to be my quadriceps femoris. Again, the most superficial, the straight muscle traveling down along the length of the thigh. This is going to be my rectus femoris, along with three vesti, one on the medial side, 
vastus medialis, one on the lateral side is going to be vastus lateralis, and one traveling deeper to the rectus femoris be between the vastus medialis and the vastus lateralis. This is going to be my vastus intermedius. All of the three vasti are getting their origin from the femur itself. You see on here, medialis, intermedius, and lateralis. They get their origin from the femur itself. The only quadriceps muscle that gets its origin not from the femur, but from the iliac bone is going to be my rectus femur. So, Rectus femoris is going to be associated with what joints? What joints am I associated to as rectus femoris? Hip joint, yes, and knee joint. Compared to the three of us tie, am I related? To the hip joint, the three vasti, vastus medialis, lateralis, and intermedius. Am I related to the hip joint? Am I passing in front, behind, on the side of the hip joint by any means? No, just the knee joint. Just the knee joint. So the only one of the quadriceps muscles that travels anterior to the hip and anterior to the knee joint is going to be my rectus femoris the three vestae lateralis medialis and intermedius those are only going to be traveling in front of the knee joint easy easy Any problem so far? Any problem? All right, so traveling in front of the hip joint, what do you think is going to be the, the action on the hip joint? Rectus femoris will be performing. Traveling in front of the hip joint, so when you shorten the length of the muscle, this is going to be pulling the thigh forward. Putting the thigh forward means I will be performing flexion of the hip joint. So the only one that helps with the flexion of the hip joint is going to be my rectus femoris. How about all the four of them, all the four muscles here? All the four muscles, as you see on here, they fuse together, they will form a common tendon. This is my quadriceps tendon that will be surrounding my patella and will be moving down to be inserted in the tibial tuberosity. This is the point of insertion for the quadriceps muscle. So you see on here, all the four muscles gonna be traveling down to be inserted in this tibial tuberosity. So what's gonna be the action on here? If I'm putting on the tibial tuberosity, if this is my leg like this, and I'm inserted in this point, I will be pulling the leg to move forward, right? So what action would I be performing? What is the angle of the joint? This is the angle of the joint. The knee joint, its angle is posterior, if you remember. So pulling the leg forward, what happens to the angle of the joint as a result? Now I am increasing the angle of the joint. This is what we call extension. So what's going to be the action here of the quadriceps femoris on the knee joint is going to be knee extension. All right, so the only one that has an effect or that has an action affecting the hip joint is going to be my rectus femoris. All the four muscles are going to be performing knee extension. Moving on 
to another group of muscles, this time located on the posterior aspect of the thigh. This group of muscle is going to be my hamstring muscles. The hamstring group is going to be formed of four muscles. Three of them are going to be located only on the posterior surface of the thigh. So we've got here on the lateral aspect of the thigh, a muscle with two heads. So we're going to call this as my biceps femoris. Biceps femoris. On the medial side of the posterior aspect of the thigh, we're going to have a muscle which is superficial. And you see on here, it has a very long tendon. Almost half of its length is a tendon. So we're going to call this muscle is my semi-tendinosis. Semi, semi-half, tendon, semi-tendinosis. Deeper to it, if I remove the semi-tendinosis, actually I can see the deeper muscle without removing the semi-tendinosis. Just remove it for a second here. I will see that this muscle is a flattened muscle. Half of its length that it will look like a membrane. So half of the length of the muscle is a membrane. So we're going to call this muscle is semimembranosis. Semimembranosis. So again, again, what are the four muscles? Uh, the three muscles that I can see in the posterior aspect of the thigh. We've got one on the lateral side of the thigh with two heads. This is going to be my biceps femoris. A superficial muscle on the medial side of the thigh. This is going to be formed of a long tendon that has a long tendon we're going to call it semitendinosus and deeper to it you're going to have a flattened muscle this is going to be my semimembranous this is what gets a lot of you confused on the exam how would i differentiate the semitendinosus semimembranosus from the biceps femoris look where is the muscle? Is the muscle located on the lateral side or on the medial side? If it's on the lateral side, this is going to be the long head of the biceps, short head of the biceps femoris. If it's on the medial side of the thigh, if it was superficial muscle, that half of its length, it's a tendon like this. This is my semi-tendinosis. If I am a deeper muscle, half of my length is going to be a membrane. It's my semi-membranosis. So again, again, we're looking here at how many muscles in the posterior compartment of the thigh. We've got three muscles. Semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis. One is superficial, one is deeper. Both are on the medial side, medial side of the thigh. My biceps femoris is going to be on the lateral side of the thigh. We're looking on here. All the three muscles are going to be traveling related to two joints, hip joint and knee joint. I'm traveling behind the hip, behind the knee. So if you're traveling behind the hip, what action would you have on the hip joint? You're pulling the thigh to move backwards. I am performing hip or thigh extension or flexion. Extension, exactly. 
And if you are traveling behind the knee, so you're going to be pulling the leg to move backward. So what is the action that I would be performing on the knee when I pull the leg backward? It's going to be knee or leg flexion. Again, again, group of muscles traveling behind the hip joint, behind the knee joint. Where is the angle of the hip joint? The angle of the hip joint is located on the anterior side. Where is the angle of the, of the knee joint? The angle of the knee joint is on the posterior side. So when I pull the femur backward like this, what happens to the angle of the joint? I'm increasing the angle of the joint. It's a hip extension. How about if I'm traveling behind the knee? I'm pulling the leg backward. So when you pull the leg backward like this, you are actually reducing the angle of the joint. So this is going to be resulting in knee flexion. Any question? Any question? Anybody is confused? How did we get extension of hip and flexion of knee? I'm traveling behind the hip and if you're traveling behind the hip, you're pulling the thigh backwards. And if you're pulling the thigh backwards, this increases the angle of the hip joint. This is hip extension. What is a prime mover for hip extension? Can you remind me, please? What is a prime mover? The main muscle that exerts the force to allow, I'm sorry, hip extension. What is the prime mover for hip extension? Prime mover for hip extension. Hip extension, hip extension. All of the four muscles here are performing hip extension, but they are not the prime mover. You see on here, all the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, all the three muscles on here are going to be traveling behind the hip. But you see, I have a very small muscle bulk traveling behind the hip. So I'm not the prime mover. The prime mover exactly is the gluteus maximus. Gluteus maximus. Thank you. Gluteus maximus. Gluteus maximus is the prime mover for hip extension. So here, what's going to be the relationship between semitendinosus, semimembranosus, biceps femoris, and the gluteus maximus in terms of hip flexion and extension? They are antagonists or synergist muscles. Are those aiding one another or they are opposing one another? They are aiding synergous muscles, exactly. Synergous muscles. All right, looking at another muscle here in the thigh, this muscle gets its origin from this anterior pointed part. This is called my anterior superior iliac spine. And it's going to be traveling down, medially, and posterior to be inserted in the medial aspect of my tibia on hip. So where is this muscle traveling? It's traveling down, backward. and travels from lateral to medial. 
So what actions would I be performing on here by this muscle? First, what are the joints am I related to? Am I associated to? Am I associated to the hip joint? What do you think? Yes or no? Are you associated to the hip joint here? Yes. Are you associated to the knee joint? Yes. So here, the sartorius muscle, this muscle, it's going to be traveling in front of my hip. At the same time, it's going to be traveling behind my knee. So you have a muscle that travels anterior to the hip joint. So what action would you be performing when you shorten the length of the muscle? When I shorten the length of the muscle, I will be aiding with flexion or extension of the hip joint. Flexion. And if you're traveling behind the knee, if this is a thigh like this, you're traveling behind the knee joint. If you are traveling behind the knee joint, so you're pulling the leg backward or forward? Backward movement, right? So backward movement of the knee joint. Backward movement, I'm sorry. Backward movement of here. I'm not sure if you can see this. Backward movement of the leg. It's gonna be flexion or extension. This needs you to remember where is the angle of the, of the knee joint. The angle of the knee joint is posterior. So when you pull the leg backwards, this is my leg now, what happened to the angle of the joint? Did it increase or decrease? I did decrease the angle. So this is gonna be flexion of knee. So if you notice on here, this is the only muscle that's going to be performing flexion of both the hip and the knee. Rectus femoris, it was traveling anterior to the hip, anterior to the knee. So it allowed flexion of hip, extension of knee. Biceps femoris, semimembranosis, semitendinosis, they are traveling behind both hip and knee joints. So they are allowing extension of the hip, uh, flexion. They are, they, are, they are performing extension of the hip, flexion of the knee. The only one that allows flexion of both hip and knee is going to be my sartorius, which is the longest muscle in your body. So again, again, what muscle are we looking at in here? This is going to be the sartorius sartorius is the longest muscle it travels anterior to both hip uh, anterior to the hip and posterior to the knee joint traveling be anterior to the hip and posterior to the knee allows me to flex the hip and flex the knee what else is an action here you see you are inserted on the medial side. Of the leg, so you're trying to pull this medial point. Laterally. I am pulling the medial point where I'm inserted. Laterally where I get the origin from. So I'm allowing a rotation of the thigh, exactly. A rotation of the thigh. So is this a medial rotation or a lateral rotation? If I am pulling the knee to travel out away from the midline, so it's gonna be lateral rotation of the thigh. Any questions? Any questions?
So just give me one second. We I will to pull the course the activity for today's class. All right, just give me one second. I will pull the activity for today's class. All right, so when you go to Canvas on here, please check out your files section. Under files, you will see lab exam four and muscles practice exam. So when you go to files, Press labs, documents, scroll all the way down. You will see on here, muscles lab practice exam. So this is gonna be the assignment for today. That's gonna be considered towards your in-class activity for today's class. So get this completed. I know that we're still have, we're still having Four, uh, four more muscles to complete. So you can just skip them for now. Those are the muscles of the leg. All right, so don't worry about the last two slides. Everything else we've covered today. All right. If I missed last week, where would I find those questions? So it is the uh, questions are going to be embedded in the lecture and they are all the lecture or the video lecture is posted on your Facebook group. All right, so for today's
activity, please complete questions from 1 to 240, 246 from, again, your five section on Canvas. So when you go to Canvas again, you press on Labs, Documents, and when you open Labs, Documents, it's gonna, it's gonna be the Muscles Lab Practice exam. All right. So let me answer some of the questions I see on here. If I missed last week, so again, the questions are going to be mentioned during the class time. All right, so just review the video recording I will be, I, I, I have posted on the Facebook group. So please request to join the Facebook group and I will accept your request as soon as I get a chance.